Okay, so um, we're starting um, exactly on time, which commendable. Um, and um, uh, I'll just sort of quickly introduce um, this formidable panel, both in terms of uh, quality as well as quantity, um, uh, and explain a little bit um, uh, the way it will work. We will start out with uh, Rick Perlstein, who, um, uh, whose books take you through the trajectory of his work, um, beginning with the um, uh, wonderful Before the Storm, Barry Goldwater, and the Unmaking of the American Consensus, which won the Los Angeles Times Book Award for History. Uh, next, he published Nixon Land, The Rise of a President and the Fracturing of America, uh, a New York Times bestseller. And, uh, widely picked as uh, one of the best nonfiction books of 2008, and most recently, uh, The Invisible Bridge, The Fall of Nixon and the Rise of Reagan, um, also um, widely uh, touted and um, uh, awarded. And so uh, Rick is in a perfect position to kind of um, talk about the continuity and discontinuity of current uh, right-wing populism, uh, ways in which um, um, there are uh, points of continuity between, let's say, the Birchites, who were um, uh, connected to the Coke Industries people and now um, uh, into the present, uh, as well as looking at elements of discontinuity. Um, we have in the, in the um, middle um, two um, remarkable um, 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 researchers of the digital world, um, John Keegan, who's a senior research fellow at the Tau Center and had worked as the visual journalist for the Wall Street Journal and uh, created, among other things, uh, the wonderful um, interactive tool uh, Blue Feed, Red Feed, which some of you may have um, uh, looked at, which reconstructs what a typical uh, uh, conservative voter or liberal voter looks at on a given day when they log on to Facebook, and he'll talk about that. Um, Jonathan Albright, who will be going next, uh, is research director at the Tau Center, um, and before that was assistant professor of media analytics at the School of Communication at Elon University. Um, and um, Albright has done remarkable work that you have probably read without necessarily knowing it in a variety of publications where he reconstructed a lot of the social network connections that emerged uh, during the 2016 uh, election campaign, and then most recently did really important groundbreaking work that, if I'm not wrong, uh, Robert Mueller used in his indictment of um, um, reconstructing um, the Russian influence. Uh, is that inaccurate, John? Uh, I, not necessarily. Okay, very good. All right. He could tell you, but he'd have to kill you. Well, as long as it's not <laughs> fake news, then we're, we're doing okay. Um, and um, so he will kind of take us up to the minute in this sort of fractured world of social media. Um, where Thomas Edsel needs no introduction to this um, crowd, um, having taught here for many years, having been um, uh, political journalist at, Wall at uh, Washington Post for 25 years, regular columnist for the New York Times, uh, and author of um, several books that um, um, that deal with many of the issues we've uh, talked about today, Chain Reaction, The Impact of Race, Rights, and Taxes on American Politics, Building Red America, The New Conservative Coalition, and The Drive for Permanent Power, and more recently, The Age of Austerity, How Scarcity Will Remake American Politics. We're counting on Tom to be the invisible bridge, so to speak, of um, the panel. And Emily Bell, who is... Um, the um, director and founder of the Tau Center for Digital Journalism here at Columbia, who uh, had a fantastic uh, career at The Guardian before coming here and pioneered their website and a lot of the uh, most uh, innovative um, interactive data and graphics journalism that we see, um, will, um, uh, I sort of posed to her, she's not giving a formal talk, but uh, asked her to think about, for example, is there a way out of filter bubbles? Uh, are social media entities, which have liked to think of themselves as merely platforms, going to accept responsibility as publishers of media? 
Uh, is there uh, a future for regulation in this area that suddenly we've all woken up to being um, so important in the shaping of our political discourse? So those are, that's sort of what we envision. So I'll stop talking and uh, hand things over to Rick. Yeah, I'm gonna be right here. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna take you through kind of a breakneck century-long tour of uh, 100 years of right-wing media. And maybe we'll call it um, from KKK to IRA. Uh, the Internet Research, Research Association. Um, so more and more I'm, I'm finding um, continuities uh, in the history of uh, reactionary movements around the world. Uh, you know, the first day of you know, history class, the professor tells you history is the study of continuity and change. I'll definitely be talking about both. But um, I've been very influenced uh, on kind of a theoretical level as a narrative historian by uh, what the political theorist Corey Robin talks about uh, in his book, The Reactionary Mind, in which he kind of finds this uh, deep structural thread uh, in right-wing movements around the world, basically since the French Revolution, uh, as attempts to uh, preserve and uh, kind of uh, uh, embank around uh, systems of kind of hierarchy and authority in the face of uh, various sorts of you know, movements of liberation, you know, attempts to uh, extend the can of social citizenship. And uh, one very important structural element of this is the tendency to see uh, basic institutions of society uh, that uh, at least people kind of within the uh, kind of cosmopolitan liberal elite, shall we say, uh, uh, see as establishment, mainstream, uh, neutral institutions as uh, basically uh, fronts for uh, a liberal world to power. Uh, and uh, a lot of what right-wing politics tries to do is uh, degrade the strategic capacity of these organizations. Uh, so, you know, think of, um, you know, the liberal media, you know, which we'll talk about, liberal universities, uh, teachers' unions, you know, unions in general. Uh, Vanessa Williams talked about uh, when right-wingers went after Planned Parenthood, it wasn't just that it was because they, you know, despised abortion, but that this was uh, a source of strategic capacity for you know, upholding uh, the liberal state. You know, they do stuff politically. Um, think about you know, the administrative state, right? In the 1980s, uh, Reaganites talked about defunding the left. And a lot of what they meant was defunding, disempowering the civil service, which Todd Gitlin talked about, right? So, um, uh, you know, mainstream liberal churches, you know, Unitarians, Methodists, you know, uh, uh, one of my grab bags of crazy right-wing insanity was when uh, McCarthyites decided that the National Council of Churches was uh, infiltrated by, you know, the Soviet Union, and their evidence for this was uh, their translation of the Bible, which uh, kind of questioned uh, or uh, uh, translated in a more the Hebrew in a more accurate way, in a way that made this, the virgin birth seem to be not so miraculous, right? Um, you know, so you could take this in American history certainly back to the 1920s in the heyday of uh, the second Ku Klux Klan. Linda Gordon down at NYU has written a really nice, compact, synthetic history of that, uh, which is a, just a great read and makes a, a great reflection on our own times. But you know, for them, it was you know, the Catholic Church, which was basically uh, seen as this, um, like the Communist Party was seen by the McCarthyites, as this uh, secret government that was uh, subverting uh, uh, Protestant Christian America. Um, uh, you know, they would refer to newspapers as Pope bossed, Jew kept. Uh, yeah, you know, so, you, so, so you see this kind of thread of continuity, right? Um, fast forwarding to the 1950s, a lot of the rhetoric uh, that you would hear uh, from someone like Henry Ford about the Jews is pretty much translated on almost like a one to one basis towards a communist. Uh, as uh, this alien force, uh, invisible, you don't know who is and who isn't, uh, that have to be kind of exposed and uh, defeated, you know, much like, you know, 
uh, people like Pamela Geller talk about, you know, Sharia law now, right? Is this force that's kind of somehow infiltrating the White House, invisible, malign, uh, everywhere. Uh, if you don't see evidence of it, that just proves how dangerous they truly are because they're hiding their hand, right? Uh, so let's talk about media and McCarthy, right? So um, the important part about conservatives and this, pro- this deeper uh, conservative project of discrediting the liberal, the institution of the so-called liberal media is uh, not merely to deride or criticize or deconstruct or delegitimate, but it's also to uh, exploit, to infiltrate, to imitate. And in the case of uh, Joseph McCarthy, um, he was very close to a lot of journalists. He was a very charming guy. Uh, McCarthy and uh, the typical insane wretch both enjoyed uh, bending an elbow at the you know local public house. Uh, and one of the things that McCarthy realized about realized about the media, which uh, should be very resonant and familiar to political observers now, is that if a senator said something, they reported it. And one of the things he realized as a senator was that he had immunity from uh, the laws of slander or libel, he wrote. So he could accuse anyone of anything, and that person could do nothing about it, and that it would end up on the front page of the Washington, uh, not the Washington Post. It would end up on the the front page of the Washington Post, which wasn't a particularly important paper at the time. It would end up on the front page of the Washington Star and the New York Times, and often without any chance for uh, the accused aggrieved party to respond. And uh, he developed very close relationships uh, with journalists, uh, especially at the paper that served basically as a kind of a newspaper of record for the Midwest, the Chicago Tribune. He had a very close friend named Willard Edwards uh, who wrote speeches for him. Willard Edwards' son, Lee Edwards, is uh, now one of the mucky mucks at the, the Heritage Foundation. But so it's not just that uh, J- Joseph McCarthy would accuse the communists of being uh, the, the the media of being you know quislings or in bed with the communists or reporters of perhaps being communists themselves. It's that he was willing to uh, use the media for his own uh, means. And the broader kind of Red Scare movement of the 1950s uh, also developed its own kind of um, para journalistic institutions very imitative of um, uh, what they would see as the compromised uh, liberal mainstream media. You know, a magazine like the American Mercury, you know, looks like, you know, a a new republic, you know. uh, But they also have these kind of privately circulated, uh, much more practical-minded publications, something like Red Channels, which was um, uh, basically a Hollywood publication that would uh, basically create blacklists of people who shouldn't be uh, hired for TV uh, because they were supposedly associated with uh, communism. But they also had basically house organs like the Chicago Tribune, you know, which would refer to um, uh, Roosevelt uh, basically as uh, almost like a a devil. So, um, of course, McCarthy is uh, discredited by 1954 with the Army McCarthy hearings. Uh, McCarthyism itself uh, becomes uh, sort of something of a, a remnant movement, but so much of uh, what represents right-wing politics at any given moment is uh, uh, the holding on uh, to notions, dispositions that had only recently been uh, mainstream uh, when the rest of society moves on. You know, think of, um, you know, as society accepts tr- the idea of trans rights, you know, or uh, gender neutral bathrooms, you know, uh, as just part of the way the world is, um, conservatives will hold on to it as an outrage, you know, part of the conspiracy. And, um, you know, 20 years from ago, you know, many of us maybe thought the idea that, well, we shouldn't have a man or men's room or a women's room a little odd or weird, right? Uh, but you know, the idea is the reactionary kind of holds on to that rage and then often absorbs it, right? Then moves on. You know, Martin Luther King was a dangerous communist in 1968. He probably had it coming. 
because, you know, uh, when he was shot, because as Ronald Reagan said, he was the one who told people that they should be able to choose the laws that they follow, right? But by, you know, 1998, 2008, certainly 2018, you know, he's a hero, right? <clears throat> so, um, you know, as McCarthy uh, goes by the wayside, um, you have this remnant uh, of reactionaries who are basically still uh, McCarthyist. And one of the guys I write about in uh, my first book, Before the Storm, Barry Goldwater and the Unmaking of the Cons American Consensus, which covers the conservative movement basically from the mid-50s to the Goldwater campaign in 1964, is this guy, uh, Robert Welch. So does anyone know who Robert Welch is? Yeah. He was the founder of the John Birch Society, right? John Birch Society was basically uh, founded in 1958. It, uh, came to public knowledge in 1961. I'll talk a little bit about that. But before there was a John Birch Society, Robert Welch was still very active in politics. I'll read a little bit from Before the Storm. Welch specialized in sales. So he, he, he basically, uh, his family had a candy business. A lot of these guys were rich industrialists. Uh, the frustrated writer's first book in 1941, The Road to Salesmanship, proclaimed selling a profession more important than law or medicine. Uh, instead of bread and circuses handed out by idle mobs by politicians, quote unquote, salesmen drove progress itself by inducing Americans to want more things and then strive to better themselves in order to earn enough to buy them. Wartime experience as an office of price administration consulted for the candy industry hardened Welch's conservatism lobbying as chair of the Washington Committee for the National Confectioners Association, petrified it. He mastered the signal vocation of America's domestic cold warriors, compiling, organizing, and cross-referencing lists and files. Think of, um, what's the guy who used to be on CNN and was on Fox News uh, with his whiteboard? Um, Glenn Beck, exactly. Uh, uh, who had belonged to what? who had been where, who knew whom. He devoured history, newspapers, socialist organs, and became convinced, incredulous, incredulous that anyone would want to deliver more power into the hands of an all-powerful central government, that Western Europe and Europe's welfare states were products of a communist conspiracy, and that the conspiracy was gaining ground here. In 1950, Welch ran for the Republican nomination for lieutenant governor of Massachusetts. He declared his platform the United States Constitution. He came in fourth. Elective office would not be his metier. The next April, in 1951, President Truman relieved General MacArthur of his command in Korea. There followed an unprecedented outpouring of popular emotion for the general uh, and a triumphant national tour. Alongside MacArthur's ongoing inquisition, it marked a new tendency on the American right. It was that much easier to believe that you were doing patriotic work even, perhaps especially, if you defied the government. In 1951, Welch traveled to New England, decrying the aid and comfort Dean Atchison's State Department was providing to the communists. In one town, a listener wrote a critical open letter to a local newspaper. Wasn't McCarthyism fast becoming a political liability for the Republican Party? Welch, compelled to answer, spent the next two weeks in a graphomaniacal stupor. His 80-page response defined a method that would hardly waver over the next 30 years and untold thousands of pages. It was a letter beginning with an apology for its length. For I have to go far afield and build up these facts step by step in order to show the ultimate impact and significance of the partly completed pattern as it now appears to me. Welch expressed befuddlement that August congressional investigators who had looked at the same facts neither knew nor took the trouble to find out the right questions to ask. Then came the eye-popping, awful revelations, thick with documentation, deduced with unshakable confidence. In this case, concerning how, at every step, Mao could have been stopped by our government. Instead, he, we deliberately turned over rule of China's 400 million people to Stalin's stooge. He sent the letter to three friends. Friends asked for copies for their friends. Soon, as if by mitosis, Welch was mailing out hundreds, then thousands of copies. Although it was not, as Welch might have put it, an accident, the master salesman had incorporated a Welch mailing committee. Five energetic young Massachusetts men, frightened to death of what has happened to our country to drum up readers. He called his tract, May God Forgive Us. 
when May God's first sales figures were tallied, Henry Regnery, the publisher, conservative publisher, told Welch the book was flying off the shelves by the tens of thousands. Welch was incredulous. Why wasn't it selling in the hundreds of thousands? Regnery protested that there simply wasn't that kind of demand for this kind of book. This Welch simply could not accept. So he revived the Welch mailing committee, bought out Regnery's inventory, and sold the book while campaigning for Robert Taft. Uh, Regnery accepted one more book from Welch, The Life of John Birch. In the story of one American boy, the ordeal of his age, it told the tale of a young American missionary comes by who learned at the close of World War II of the communist secret plan to take over China. He was assassinated. His murder supposedly covered up by the State Department quizlings who knew if the story got out, their own complicity in Mao's victory would be revealed. John Birch was the first casualty of the Cold War. If he had lived, how different the world would have been. If every American knew this story, how ready everyone would be to do what was right. Regnery's stubborn refusal to realize his obligation to Western civilization, not to stop until he had put this story into the hands of every American, convinced Welch that he once more would have to do the job himself. The hour was late. For now, he had discovered how Dwight Eisenhower's career, long liaison in cooperation with the Communist Party, had led the fall to the fall of Eastern Europe. He circulated his 300-page letter on the subject, the politician, to a few close friends who could handle this level of truth. Now here's some uh, right-wing media uh, infrastructure. Robert Welch built the John Birch Society on the foundation of two important earlier groups that kept alive the conservative message during the rights years in the wilderness. One was the National Association of Manufacturers. Welch was the uh, chair of its education committee. Then there was the Foundation for Economic Education on whose board Welch served. Uh, Fee and Nam, Foundation for Economic Education and the National Association of Media, were conservative media empires. Welch took inspiration from them to build a media empire of his own. First, he put out his own magazine, One Man's Opinion. When it passed a few thousand in circulation, he changed its name to American Opinion. In 1957, he retired from business. Uh, he realized that if he recruited enough people to explain the conspiracy, the conspiracy could not work. He figured he'd need about a million people to rout the communists once and for all. He founded the John Birch Society on December 8th, 1958. So basically, if you think about it, he has this magazine, American Opinion, which looks like a Time magazine. But he also has this newsletter. And uh, Vanessa was talking about how conservative media, I think of Fox News, uh, is very instrumentalist, right? It's about kind of uh, giving uh, marching orders. Um, and uh, uh, it's also, again, so you have kind of like the, the sort of the kind of like the back channel kind of arterial network stuff, the newsletter, and you got the kind of like the public facing kind of magazine stuff, uh, which often uh, is imitative of uh, parasitic on uh, the kind of media that it's uh, seeking to supplant or to, uh, uh, so like for a great example is in the 1970s when Pat Robertson started the 700 Club, right? He very explicitly tried to create a right-wing Christian version of The Tonight Show. He sits behind a desk, he interviews people, right? So it's not just that they're like, oh my God, this media is evil, we have to root it out, uh, you know, uh, root and branch. Um, but so basically he has this uh, newsletter, and what the newsletter is about is um, issuing orders. And I'm going to just read one more little bit about the, the John Birch Society, and this is how it became um, public for the first time. It was kind of like doing all this kind of underground work, and then suddenly in 1961, Time Magazine reports about it. Um, uh, in Time Magazine in April of 1961. The John Birch Society apparently believed Dwight David Eisenhower to be a secret agent of the international communist conspiracy. The group's absolute leader was a man named Robert Welch. There was a governing council, but it was said that the governing council's main purpose was to choose a successor should, should Welch be assassinated by communists. Uh, every year, the society published a scoreboard of how far down the road to complete communist subversion each country was. The United States was at 56, 50 to 60%, Iceland, was at 80 to 
According to Time, the John Burt Society was, quote, a goose step away from the formation of goon squads. So there's this kind of self-evident world that, you know, uh, this crazy guy, you know, is kind of disseminating. And suddenly this idea that, wow, you wake up one Tuesday in November and suddenly, suddenly realize that there's lots of people who think things that you think are crazy. Um, to congressmen, the eerily uniform flood of letters they had been receiving calling for the impeachment of Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren finally made sense. That was one of the society's four goals, along with saving HUAC, abolishing the income tax, and banning the sale of goods manufactured in communist countries. The media coverage opened the eyes of community groups whose meetings were being disrupted by unfamiliar faces shouting republic every time someone called America a democracy because it was society doctrine that democracy meant rule by mob and society tactics to press the case through mob heckling. Uh, and the eyes of PTA leaders opened who had learned to rue sudden spikes in membership. Welch had earned, urged members to join the local PTA and go to work to take it over. So this idea that we see over and over again of these kind of arterial networks that kind of proceed stealthily, right? Uh, and then suddenly uh, the rest of the world realized this, this, is, this has been going on. Um, so there's another kind of interesting element we have to fold into this pattern. And that's um, the so-called uh, mainstream media. How does it respond to um, the emergence of right-wing energies? One way is the way we saw Time Magazine talking about these crazy people, the, the, the John Birch Society, who are a goose, a goose step away from the formation of goon squads, right? Which is this kind of kind of strenuous kind of editorial independence, right, and judgment. Uh, that's actually, you know, quite striking. Uh, Glenn Beck appeared on, you know, the cover of Time Magazine, this kind of an interesting figure, you know. Um, Ann Coulter appeared on the cover of Time Magazine. It's a very different way of thinking about the right. The one is this kind of, let's say, kind of Walter Cronkite passing judgment from top down that these guys are beyond the pale. The other is, wow, there's this thing out there. We better pay close attention to it. It's, uh, it's, it's called the James Bennett New York Times editorial page uh, perspective. So what is the bridge uh, that gets us from one conception within the mainstream media to this other conception? Uh, to my reading, uh, in my second book, Nixonland, a very important watershed for this was um, the late 60s. And one of the things that happened in the late 60s is I tell a story in Nixonland about a, a friend of mine named Lewis Cook. Uh, Lewis Cook is about 80 now. But in 1968, he was a employee of NBC News, working in Chicago. Uh, he was uh, first asked by NBC to prepare a memo, uh, letting them know what they could expect in the streets of Chicago uh, during the Democratic National Convention. And he basically said he knew cops, and he knew new left guys. He was a new left sympathizer. And he said, this is going to be very, very ugly. They assigned my friend Lou to basically be the producer of the famous street footage uh, of um, uh, first on, uh, as it happened on the Monday night of the convention after the Yippies camped out in uh, Lincoln Park uh, on Chicago's north side by the lake and defied the curfew. Uh, cops waded into the park, started beating up kids. Kids spilled out in the street. They chanted, the whole world is watching. Uh, great book, by the way. Uh, and uh, then on Thursday night, uh, they try to uh, march to the um, convention hall from the downtown hotel, the Hilton, at uh, Balbo and uh, Michigan Avenue. And very famously, they sat down in the middle of the intersection. Cops, again, waded into the crowd, randomly started beating people in the head, shoved them into paddy wagons, locked the doors of the paddy wagons. I mean, not shoved them into paddy wagons, shot tear, ga tear gas canisters into the paddy wagons that locked the doors and took them to jail, right? And we're beating people up all over the city. Now, my friend Lou was very proud of, you know, his kind of field work recording this stuff. Uh, it didn't show live because of an interesting technological quirk. Uh, you had to develop the film. So it was shown kind of half an hour later, very famously 
Uh, it was watched on kind of portable television sets within the convention hall. This is all the, the stuff of uh, 60s lore. Uh, then Thursday, uh, after the convention session, he went back to the um, studio, the NBC studio in Chicago. And they were very overworked, and they said, Lou, why don't you man the switchboard? We're getting a lot of calls. He thought he had done a great thing for the anti-war movement, uh, demonstrating uh, the basically a fascist authoritarian tactics of Chicago police. Next thing he knows, he's picking up the phone, and people are like, what are you communists doing? What did you do to provoke this? Those cops are right. Those kids had it coming. And uh, he was astonished, right? Uh, and he wasn't the only one who was astonished. Um, basically, this idea that uh, masses and masses of Americans, majorities in public opinion polls, would believe that uh, the cops were right to do this and the kids were wrong to protest was eye-opening to uh, the filter bubble, shall we say, of uh, the media elites in their towers, you know, in Columbus Circle and Rockefeller Center. Okay. Um, so, um, basically, to make a long story short, that's uh, what I would call ground zero of the attempt to bend over backwards to be fair to this reactionary sentiment that was a lot more profound and a lot greater than anyone in the media had ever imagined. Uh, there was a very um, uh, fascinating column by uh, the media columnist, columnist uh, the, the, the very prominent Washington Post columnist Joseph Kraft, saying there's this middle America out there. Uh, none of us know it. Uh, it's a very familiar rhetoric to, now, to us now. And that's how you get people like uh, Pat Buchanan, the Nixon staffer, gets his own nationally syndicated column. That's how William Sapphire becomes a columnist. Uh, in the New York Times. Um, and uh, this is a very important uh, development in this kind of historical process I'm talking about because this uh, creates whole new opportunities for right-wing media to uh, tell their story in the mainstream media. Um, let me flash forward uh, to another important moment in the history of the story that gets us to 2018, and that's after Nixon's resignation. Uh, and um, the right wing uh, begins a revival, basically. And uh, this is a formation known as the New Right. And uh, we use the phrase New Right fairly loosely now, but then it referred to something very specifically. It was a group of extremely aggressive operatives based mostly in Northern Virginia who uh, used kind of the social issues, anger over gay rights, the ERA and things like that to um, find um, uh, pockets of discontent with uh, the progress of liberalism and use that to kind of basically convert people into um, political voters or at least are political activists at best. And one of the key figures of this was a guy named Richard Vigri. And he was basically the master of a medium of political communication known as direct mail, uh, which were generally terrifying letters that were sent to mailing lists that were collected uh, via um, uh, people who had donated to conservative causes, uh, people who had you know, checked boxes and sent in coupons that were uh, placed in uh, newspaper advertisements. Uh, one of his masterpieces uh, was something called the wife letter. Usually these letters were terrifying, right? It was liberals are taking over, they're teaching your kids, you know, cannibalism and sex ed and the rest. But um, one, of the, uh, one of my favorite examples of Richard Vigory's work uh, was something called the wife letter. And I tell the story in the book I'm working on now, uh, writing about a 1978 congressional race for an open seat in Illinois uh, in which uh, one of the candidates was a conservative from a big conservative political family named Dan Crane, who was kind of a dark horse candidate. Uh, um, according to a Washington Post reporter, following the contest since February, contest since February, Dan Crane was getting thoroughly clobbered. In the first televised debate, the dynamic, thoughtful, experienced Democratic nominee who had never lost an election, quote, offered reasoned, cautious answers. Crane turned the debate into an aggressive rant against communism. Um, following that debate, 
Crane's media advisors panicked. They decided their candidate was frightening people. They advised him to bow out of the second debate. Uh, Bruce ad addressed an empty chair instead, uh, hammering his opponent's confusion and simplistic worldview. Crane decided it was time to pull out the big gun. He called up Falls Church, Virginia, and told Richard Vigory to unleash the wife letter. The wife letter was Vig Vigory's thermonuclear bomb, the, quote, single most potent piece of mail in American political history. The process of producing a wife letter began with the candidate's spouse with pen in hand, following a careful blueprint laid out from on high, heavy on family chit-chat and relatively light on the issues. Judy Crane, mother of four, had dutifully complied back during the primary with a missive that began with dear friend, continued with the family and all. We have four small children who are expecting our fifth in July. I haven't had too much time to myself, but I made up my mind today to sit down and write you. It went on for about four pages about Dan's concerns as a family man, about inflation, taxes, energy, and farm problems. It concluded, the baby's crying, so I must close for now. P.S. If you would like to chat with me about Dan's campaign, please feel free to call me at home at 217-443-0085. The manuscript was then shipped to Falls Church, Virginia, embossed onto creamy feminine stationery, then folded mechanically and stuffed into, quote, personalized pastel envelopes upon which a worker would fix a stamp by hand, slightly crooked. Um... Uh, Family pictures were enclosed. The unit cost was about double the typical direct mail letter. Okay, give me a minute. Uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was worth it. Knocking on doors before the primary again and again, Crane received heartfelt testimony. I got a real nice letter from your wife. Uh, the Post reporter interviewed a 61-year-old night watchman whose wife had voted for every Democrat since 1948. They couldn't get her to vote for no Republican anyway. Then all of a sudden, it seems like she's talking about this here Crane. My wife got this letter. It's that picture. I told her to throw it away, but she still got it. Keeps it right there by the TV. So um, we got the um, public-facing right-wing media, and then you have these kind of arterial networks. Uh, and of course, Dan Crane wins the election, and everyone is shocked. How did this dark horse win? And um, the reason I called my paper um, uh, like having a wa water moccasin for a watchdog was, that was what Richard Mickery said was the secret to direct mail, right? Um, it's like having a water moccasin for a watchdog, silent but deadly. This underground arterial network. Dark, dark right, dark posts. So that was my uh, setup for uh, the kind of empirical work that our uh, scholars have done, uh, you know, uh, documenting the bots and uh, the wife letters of 2016. Thanks. <laughs> Okay. Hello, I'm John Keegan. I'm a senior research fellow here at the Tau Center. Uh, I'm going to tell you about this project, Blue Feed, Red Feed, that I did. Um, I'm a visual journalist. Uh, I worked at the Wall Street Journal for 18 years. Um, so I write code and I design projects and I do my own research and reporting. Um, and this was a project that I had wanted to do for a very long time, but I had a hard time finding data that was good enough to use at the Wall Street Journal to do this. What I had uh, experienced was everybody knows that their Facebook feed is different from everyone else's. We all have our own sources. But I wanted to actually see what the other side was seeing. And um, the, the impetus for this was my wife wanted to leave Facebook. Uh, she, was, she was sick of Facebook and she was ready to delete her account. And I was like, Facebook's great. What are you talking about? It's really interesting. There's lots of great articles. She's like, your Facebook is great. Mine is is terrible. And um, the problem was her father's side of the family um, had very different worldview than uh, than my wife and I. And so they started posting uh, a lot of stuff. And she loved these people. We all we care about them a great deal. But we just have such different. Um, you know, uh, philosophies on a lot of things, as I'm sure everybody else does. You have some family that maybe goes off in a different direction than you politically. Um, so she started taking screenshots of what her Facebook feed looked like with all of her relatives. And it was really startling. It was like my rational brain said, I know that it's different, but when you see it, that's when you feel the emotion. And I said, that's a powerful thing. I want to try and create some kind of uh, visualization of this so people can feel that same gut punch when you see something that looks so different. So I went out to start looking for data. Um, Pew Research did some fantastic work on uh, polarization and media habits 
um, back in 2014. Um, and they had a lot of really great stuff. One of the, my favorite details they uncovered was um, liberals and conservatives react very differently when they encounter news that is counter-attitudinal. Uh, liberals are more likely to unfriend someone when they post something that they're, they find offensive, but conservatives were less likely to have those friends in the first place. They had a more homogenous group of friends. So lots of really great stuff in this study here. Um, and this was the, the kind of thing I was looking for, something that um, based on a lot of really um, solid data would be able to give me a list of sources that are popular with partisan users on Facebook. Um, so they came close with this. They had about, I think about 2,000 survey respondents for this. So this was pretty good, but it didn't have the kind of depth or the, um, the a longer list of sources, a pretty short um, list of sources. And then Facebook, um, they have this you know, uh, research wing, um, and uh, they undertook this really interesting study um, to, to answer the question, um, is the filter bubble phenomenon caused by their algorithm, or is it by the behavior of the users? And wouldn't you know, they found it was the user's fault um, and got themselves off the hook. Um, but it was a really good study. They, um, they basically they published in Science uh, as peer review. They released all the, uh, the, the replication data. Um, and they, what they did was they took 10 million uh, users in the US who had identified their political leanings in their profile. Uh, this is what it looks like when you add your political leanings to your profile if you haven't done this. Uh, it's a free form field. You can type in anything you want. So what they used was machine learning to take all of the different um, you know, um, descriptions and put them into one of five buckets, uh, very liberal, liberal, neutral, conservative, or very conservative. They, sh they followed these 10.1 million people um, and every piece of content they shared over six months. And that gave them a very good idea which sources were really popular with these partisan users. Um, they filtered out soft news, things like recipes or travel stories, and they were left with um, a, you know, a, a large number of stories. Um, they assigned an alignment score to the sources for all these news. And this is what I was interested in. So we, um, we basically just said, all right, we're really interested in the stuff that is on the far left and the far right and um, you know, shared by a majority of the users. So we basically looked at everything um, you know, um, with a majority on, on both sides. We also filtered out some of the smaller sites um, and only used um, stories that had been shared more than 100 times. Uh, and so this is what we built. Now, we were forced by the standards and ethics editors of the journal to have a very lengthy, <laughs> lengthy and detailed um, kind of speed bump at the beginning of the project to explain exactly what they'd be seeing. This was not something that the journal was uh, comfortable publishing uh, without a lot of, um, you know, kind of framing. Um, so, and we wanted to make sure people understood. We were using Facebook's own tool and their own, their own research and their own data to actually illustrate this, this kind of problem with their platform. So we were very careful to, to not break the terms of service or to you know, um, go outside the bounds of, of anything that Facebook would expect us to do as well. So we, um, we kind of, uh, basically it was what we built. We built something just around um, topics. So we took these list of sources that were popular. We, uh, we scrape them every hour to pull down um, the, the stories that are coming from all these sources. We save them in a database, and then we just did a simple keyword search by topic, and we curated this list of topics over time that changed. We had lots of shootings. We had lots of you know, strange uh, events in the news that we didn't think would become polarized, and of course they did. So this is what we ended up building, you know, a liberal feed on the left in blue and a conservative feed um, on the on the right in red, um, and uh, it was a powerful a powerful visualization. Um, the imagery that is used in these uh, on both sides, I think, was really surprising. Um, we were I was constantly amazed at the uh, ability to pick the most unflattering uh, portrait of the of the person on the other side of the spectrum. Um, so uh, sometimes uh, one of the things we also did was to, um, in an effort to try and uh, let people understand the size of the audiences on the other side with sources you're not familiar with, um, we listed all of the sources and the number of, of likes that they have and followers that they have. So you get a sense, if, you've, if you're on the left, you may not have heard of a lot of these sources, but they're, they have massive audiences. Uh, and that's kind of some of the research that I'm doing now at the Tau Center is 
um, creating a tool called Source Reporter that allows you to just get a background check on one of these sources if you haven't heard of them before, because you may not realize the size of these audience that they have. They're very influential. Um, and sometimes, you know, you have these moments where things kind of sync up with the imagery and you really see it laid bare exactly how far apart they are. Um, and sometimes the actual words are the same, too, on both sides. Um, this was after this, uh, the State Department released some details on her emails. Um, so some stories unexpectedly became really popular when Harambe the gorilla was shot um, after a little boy fell into the pen at the zoo. Um, after about 24 hours, that story became racially charged and um, took off in both directions. And um, my editor and I would come in in the morning and just be like, I think we have to run this new story through the Bluefeed Redfeed and see, what, see what's happening in there. And uh, we intentionally didn't allow users to kind of do that. We didn't want it to be a fire hose or people to kind of use it. We wanted to really just pick a couple of topics and, uh, and show how clearly it, um, it pick, pick stories that really did illustrate this uh, polarization. Um, we have lots of opportunities to use it um, as uh, when, in a regular news story, like when there was in the Orlando shooting, and it was a very, very popular piece of content uh, for the journal the year it ran. Um, it's still up and running today, but it's not really maintained. Um, so people were very uh, thankful and happy that we built this, but they were also kind of depressed. They were like, this is amazing. Ugh, you know, just like when you actually see some of the other reactions, it's um, it's it's kind of dispiriting. But I, I do feel like it's no matter which side you're on, it's really important to see this stuff. You have to actually go and do this. And the other thing that was um, that kind of made me build this was the Facebook's design of their own platform actually kind of makes it really hard to try and build a view like this. Um, we know that people react differently when they see this content. So even if you um, wanted to follow uh, a source on the other side of the spectrum, you have to like it. That's the verb you use. And then your friends can see that. And we know if you're a liberal, your friends might unfriend you. So um, they have some inherent flaws with their platform that kind of dissuade you from doing this kind of exploration or having a more balanced news diet. Um, so. I wanted to show, I, I've given this talk a few times and I wanted to kind of show now a few things that have happened since. Like what, what's Facebook doing about this? How they have acknowledged this? I, I listened with great interest as people talked about the filter bubble problem after launching this project. One, um, you know, Barack Obama has talked an enormous amount about this. Every, you know, since leaving office, you, I've, I've listened uh, in a bunch of different speeches he's given and he actually took Mark Zuckerberg aside um, at a conference and, and gave him a very pointed kind of warning about this. Um, it's, it's definitely a topic that um, people have latched onto. Now, I should also say that it shares a lot of the common DNA with um, the fake news problem. So there's kind of like this um, mix of issues at Facebook that are plaguing Facebook's uh, platform and also Twitter and others. But um, they are related in some, in some ways, and it kind of leads to this kind of stew of distrust. Um, so to do a little bit of this tracking of some of the, um, the, the moves that Facebook have made, I make a little plug here to our little um, platforms and publisher timeline that we put together down at the Tau Center. This is uh, a fantastic way for you to um, analyze the incredibly dizzying amount of different changes to algorithms and, and all of the big platforms that Emily um, included in the work for the Platform Press. Um, it's, a, it's a ridiculous amount of stuff and it's very hard to find elsewhere, so this is a great resource for tracking down all the moves that Facebook and Twitter and others have made. Um, so this all kind of started, I was actually working on this project um, when Gizmodo published this really blockbuster story about how uh, you know, there were some Columbia J School grads working down in the basement of Facebook down in Manhattan who were, uh, you know, kind of flagging this uh, trending topics thing. It wasn't truly automated at all. And, you know, there were charges that they were suppressing conservative news. Um, so that brought a huge amount of attention to, uh, to Facebook. And people started asking questions. And my project was quickly uh, approved <laughs> in the newsroom. It became very newsworthy. Um, also, want to make a plug for the Wired cover story this month um, from Nicholas Thompson and Fred Vogelstein. It is one of the most definitive, uh, you know, tellings of this entire era. It's really important to read, um, and it's for me. It, it was a perfect way to frame all of this crazy stuff. So, um, 
So the, one of the first things they did was, you know, um, this is, you know, before the election. Um, you're getting the sense that Facebook is kind of aware of some of these problems with the fake news was starting to really kind of bubble up. The clickbait stuff was really more of an issue, I think, at the time. Um, but the filter bubble stuff, people were really starting to realize this. Um, Eli Pariser, uh, the founder of Upworthy, was, was the first person to really kind of throw this down as a big topic in his book um, about filter bubbles. Um, a few years back, but uh, you can start to see Facebook starting to kind of get a little uncomfortable and start to react to some of these uh, critiques. So they start to um, reposition the newsfeed a little bit. And Adam Masseri, who's the VP of, of the newsfeed, he's one of the voices you'll hear most talk about this. Um, he's like, oh, you know, friends and family, we're going to kind of emphasize friends and family now at, at first. Um, the goal is to inform and entertain. You know, the, he's laid out these like news feed values for um, for them to follow. Um, authentic communication, and you control your uh, your experience. And there's going to be constant iteration. So he kind of lays down this framework for uh, and set of values for the uh, news feed. Um, you know, and then uh, the election happens, and uh, there's a lot of people asking questions about Facebook's role and fake, fake news and how did this happen. And uh, the very famous defensive tweet now from, I mean, uh, post on Facebook from Zuckerberg, where, oh, you know, it's not a big deal. It is most, almost 99% of the stuff they saw is authentic. And everybody's like, where did you get this number? Where's the data for this? You know, and he's just basically like, nothing to see here. Please move on. Um, it's, this, this is not going to age well. It hasn't, and it's not, it continually, people look back at this one for years, I think. Um, and then you have this 6,000 word manifesto that Zuckerberg puts out in February of, of 2017. Um, you know, and it's a big, I think it's a big thoughtful piece. And I, you know, I truly believe that like, you know, he, he realizes that there's some big issues that are kind of existential threats to his, his company. Um, you know, filter bubbles and fake news are mentioned as like a core thing, but it's very sweeping. It's all about a global community and, um, you know, kind of just, you know, elevating the goal and realizing that the, the, the worldwide role they have now serving a quarter of the Earth's population. Um, and so, you know, they talk about, so I kind of highlighted some of the stuff around, around uh, polarization. And, you know, they're putting, for, he's putting forth this idea of maybe we show a bunch of different ideas and perspectives and show where you fall in that. So you're, you're getting a sense they're coming up with, you know, throwing some ideas out there, warming up to some solutions. Um, you know, and he does mention, you know, the two most discussed things, uh, concerns this past year were about diversity of viewpoints, filter bubbles, and accuracy of information. So, um, he, you know, he's, he's furrowing his brow and he's worried about these two problems. And then it's kind of crickets for a while where everybody's like, okay, well, what are you going to do about it? You know? And then they slowly start to release these changes. Um, the news feed, they're kind of taking action to get rid of some of the most clickbaity headlines, which you saw on both sides in the Blue Feed, Red Feed project. Um, you know, so there's Sarah, we're going to make some tweaks. So as we said, we're going to be constantly iterating and changing things. Um, so little, you know, changes here and there. And then they have this big introducing hard question stuff. But they, there's this position where they're kind of just like, don't worry, we've got this, we're working on this. And then they say, these are really hard questions, it turns out. We're going to, we need help, you know, so we're going to ask you guys to help us figure this out all out together. And they lay out these really difficult issues that they've identified that they need to talk. And they, it's a series of posts that's still ongoing. And these are some of the questions they ask, you know, like, you know, are your, so your kids are online, but will it be all right? And should I be afraid of facial recognition? What, where are the, these, ad, these Russian ads you shared with Congress? Can we see them? Um, so this is a series that's showing up on their, um, their newsroom uh, PR site. So this, I literally started writing an email to their email address that they had set up. Um, hard questions at fb.com and I, I and then I was like oh this is really like a post so I pitched it to CJR and it was basically just like release the data you know like you guys are asking for help you know we're ready to help here and we want to understand the effects of your platform but you know everything is shrouded in NDAs and they're not really transparent they talk a big game about that and they, it's very rare that they do this and this week we just saw yesterday Twitter came out with a you know um, with a with a Jack Dorsey came out with a very bold um, stake 
of putting out, you know, doing a lot of research about the platform, committing to releasing it all, um, and having it peer reviewed and published um, with full transparency. So it's interesting to see how the different platforms are going to be kind of trying to outdo each other in transparency going forward. Um, and then you saw one of these uh, answers was uh, in this, these hard questions was about the effect of, of social media on democracy. Um, and uh, th this uh, product manager here within um, Facebook is really touting this related articles feature, which is very hard to come across. They've tried to, I think, boost it a little bit in people's feed now. But I mean, it basically, I, I don't think it's really gonna, you know, kind of grab people's attention. It just kind of, after you've clicked on the link, it shows you a few other things from a variety of different sources. It's very subtle. Um, and then Adam Masseri um, starts talking about, this is, this is the, um, one of the big, um, this is the, probably one of the biggest shifts that they've made in their, in their history of their product. They're basically just saying, okay, you know that goal we had about getting uh, content that's relevant to our users is the biggest goal? Scratch that. Now it is connecting you with friends and family. That's the most important thing. The news stuff, yeah, it's interesting, but it's secondary. So they, they're gonna elevate the posts that inspire back and forth discussion in the comments. And so that's the, that's the signals, those are the signals now that they're paying attention to that are gonna boost it further in your feed and the news stuff is taking a back seat. Um, but we also saw that they ended this little experiment of having this two feeds, um, like having a separate news feed in certain countries they were experimenting with recently. Um, and they basically just said, okay, well we tried that, people don't like it, so we're not gonna do it anymore. So <laughs> you just get this feeling that they're kind of just all over the place, they're trying stuff, they know it's a big problem. And you know, I'm sure they mean well. I mean, these people really do think they're changing the world. So you give them, a, I cut them a little slack with that. But at the end of the day, there is this pattern of not being, you know, not following up their words with action. Um, and then, you know, Zuckerberg did a longer post um, uh, after this choice to kind of demote news. And, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see how this goes. But, uh, you know, he's fully expecting that people are going to spend less time on Facebook now. And there's a lot of other stuff coming out. And he warned his shareholders, too. He said, we're going to be, the amount of money we're going to be spending to fight fake news is substantial and it's going to affect profits. So he is, you know, talking a big game about trying to solve this thing. But it's going to require a huge shift in their behavior, I think, and how they engage with the community of journalists and researchers who are trying to do this. We have um, some of the um, research going on at the Tau Center looking at the Facebook fact check initiative, um, the partnership that they had. Um, Mike and Annie, um, one of the Tau fellows, was you know talking to all the people who are participated in this um, you know this partnership, um, PolitiFact and Snopes. Uh, how how did this whole how is this going? How is this uh, this big effort you guys announced to to fact check fake news? And it. You know, the report's coming out soon, but the long and short of it is, it's kind of a mess, and it's not working well, and people were like not being able to communicate with each other. So it seemed like a kind of a, a, a an effort that was put out there with a lot of fanfare. It hasn't really been followed up with a lot of, um, a, you know, action or care or resources. So it doesn't look like, um, a, a, you know, a happy ending for that stuff. So um, that's all I have to say about this stuff, but uh, thank you very much. Let me uh, get this to full screen. There we go. So I, I got a little wordy with, with my panel uh, title, but I think that it, it's um, an interesting topic to engage with right now. So I mostly study uh, data analytics, I guess, in the context of social media to understand and make sense of how technology is starting to creep into certain parts of our society and culture. Um, reconstruct social networks, um, and I've focused more recently on what I'm terming as accountability data. So one of the big problems I, with journalism at the moment and with fact-checking and truth is that we don't have a lot of the data to really reconstruct the past. So one of the, my big concerns right now is a lot of funders and a lot of um, researchers are kind of racing towards solutions when we don't understand the problem. We're missing a lot of the data. The, I mean, the data is either being held by Facebook Mueller clearly has some of the data, but we don't have the data to kind of reconstruct the past so we can understand how to move forward. And this is becoming more and more of a problem. So, and I think this is part of the, part of the kind of proliferation of, you know, a lot of think piece type 
articles about the election and about influence and about did social media change the outcome of the election, we really can't dive into this and engage with these types of questions. Um, very, very important questions unless we can actually, data have in, in a lot of ways become facts. So when we try to fact check, if we're trying to fact check based on content, I mean, that's one thing, but often in these cases where claims are made about how many Facebook posts reach how many people in the United States over what period of time, and we can't even get a number for that, a round number, um, it becomes a problem. So I've really focused on uh, not only just doing academic work, but also uh, getting my data and using that and repackaging it in a format where I can present that back and give that back to journalists so they can use it to write stories. So that's kind of my, it's like social justice data. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, that's probably a bad way. I, I like accountability data. I really, because I think that it, you know, it's, it's the data that backs up claims made by platforms, Facebook, tech, um, about impact on society. So I didn't plan to give this panel or th this particular talk, but uh, what I've seen in the past couple weeks, I decided it was, it was fairly important. So it actually doesn't really run or intersect directly with the, the kind of Russian um, or, or election, so, but it does relate to the kind of broader problems that we have, which I think are actually more important than the, the questions around Russia. So I will just jump into it here. So just looking through this, I, you know, I'm not a scholar who studies populism per se, um, but I wanted to look at in, in the context of social platforms and free speech and also kind of monetization and questions around uh, what's making some of these things happen and, and how do we understand it and how do we um, deal with a lot of the issues that John Keegan brought up where, um, you know, how, how do we understand if Facebook is making the right changes? How do we understand if, uh, if people are really speaking out or if some of these things are actually being falsely amplified and how, and how do we assign responsibility to technological systems and platforms to understand this? So it's a trick question actually. Um, so the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, right after the Parkland shooting, um, I started to see signals and patterns that were troubling, I guess, in the sense that, you know, that kind of suggested that maybe we actually haven't moved forward in, in the fight against propaganda and misinformation, disinformation, hoaxes. So all the things that kind of compounded in the 2016 election, may, maybe we actually haven't moved forward. So it's, you know, using examples like this, this is from last week, uh, you start to type in things like mass shootings, are and you get just you know you get a proliferation of of suggestions that say fake American problem terrorism they're rare they're Democrats like even Democrats mass shootings are Democrats so you know it's it's really it's really confusing and it's a it's a little bit um, problematic it's kind of eyebrow raising and so what I did was one of the first things that I did was I actually went and I logged you know I, I did this actually last year but so I kind of went back again I almost a year and a half later and looked at some of the recommendations for uh, what Google was giving me around kind of controversial topics that have been in the zeitgeist of news, I suppose. So I'll just show this really quick. This isn't my main uh, presentation point, but let me... Um Can I? <laughs> I've, got, I've got to show these, sorry. there. That was easier. So, you know, you just get these kinds of results. So one of the big questions we contacted Google about, or I contacted Google about this, and they responded immediately. I mean, maybe 30, 30 minutes. I mean, which, which was actually surprisingly. Um, and it was one of the uh, people there, Danny Sullivan, he, used to, he started up a, a company called Search, um, Search Engine Watch. So I think that um, when you start to see things like this, you know, what is this representation? Like, how does this play into kind of things and impressions and understanding, especially for people who are growing up and maybe children and younger users. Um, what happens when you type in, you know, you're not even finished and we're, we're getting things like black lives. I mean, I wasn't even finished typing and we get black lives don't matter. So we're getting all of this kind of noise. Um, and I guess the question from, a, from the, the, the context of populism is, is how do we, I mean, do the, are these things just merely a representation of what, you know, what, was not in the light before, or, or communities and ways of thinking and ideologies that existed before we could see these things on the internet. So Google claims that the search, 
suggestions that we get, the autocomplete suggestions and the search suggestions that we get are, are mostly come from, they're, they're slightly personalized, but they mostly come from previous searches. So this is like an idea of pop, like, so the more that people search for a term, um, the more these the recommendations will come up and they're actually ranked. So kind of going down here, you know, I just thought I would try a few different searches. So we get Nazis are, and it's the new normal, um, the best villains. I think that's from, that's from some type of um, play. So, but you know, it starts to get worse. So get, you know, feminist, when I typed in feminist are, we get feminists are crazy, feminists are insane. Uh, so it's basically all negative, right? And, and I know that there's a word order issue here because if you type in are feminist, it'll be slightly different. But, but it still doesn't matter. I mean, when, when these companies have the kind of advanced technologies and natural language processing and the ability to uh, make sense out of context, um, the question is, is, should we be getting these results? So lots of people, you know, when I was tweeting about this, lots of people were saying, we don't need more censorship. Like, don't say these types of things. So it's a huge free speech issue. But I'll just kind of scroll through here. This is not not my main presentation. But again, over and over again, the KKK is Christian organization um, still around, getting bigger, awesome. The KKK is, I mean, Google is giving these suggestions now, last week. Uh, these are taken down, I believe. So I think that Google went in and actually manually removed these. And this is becoming a theme, this manual removal theme. Um, and I'll, I'll get back, I'll come back to that. Uh, Nazis, let's just go down here. You know, some things are subjective. I just thought I would try Black Panther because it's been a flashpoint. Um, but, you know, you get overrated. But there was one suggestion here that I think is a, that could be, you know, interpreted as problematic, and that is too black. The Black Panther is too black. Um, <laughs> so so I'm not, I don't want to get into movie reviews, I mean, as, in terms of like a discourse analysis. But uh, so police are evil, police are useless, uh, police are pigs, they're not your friends, they're corrupt. I'm just going through these, you know, I was kind of thinking out. Um, but then you start to get into fact checking, right? So then you start to get into actually ob more objective, less, less kind of interpretive uh, search suggestions. Ferguson was a lie, Ferguson was staged, Ferguson was not about race. And then you, you start to think, you know, is someone gaming these? Are, are, people, are, are people running kind of automated search queries for input to increase the frequency of what I would say is our, you know, what I would call negative or uh, controversial kind of counter suggestions to kind of the main dominant narrative? Is that, is that populist, you know? So let's keep going here. I'll just show the last. Michael Brown was a thug. Michael Brown was no angel. Uh, so you just kind of you, you see the same thing over and over again. Mass shootings are fake. I saw that. Um, so David Hogg uh, is obviously the one, you know, the, the, the teen that's kind of stepped up from that Parkland shooter, mm. Parkland shooting incident, and they've, you know, they've labeled him, the, the kind of far right has labeled him as a crisis actor, and, and they've, they've kind of successfully, unfortunately, pushed the debate from what should be about guns and what should be about Second Amendment and what should be about safety in schools. They've, 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 they were successful, for the most part, in pushing this over to essentially what, is a, what should have been a non-topic, right? I mean, the crisis actor. So everything kind of shifted over. I was watching this as, as it unfolded. And I started to see, you know, when you type in David Hogg over and over again, you would get actor, you would get crisis actor. So people were saying, well, that's because that people are actually searching and they want to find out if he is, if it's true, right? So it's a fact checking. So my answer to these things is that when you get, when you get these types of results and when you get these types of suggestions, this, this is a psychological process that actually preempts even people's you know, the action of fact checking. So this is before they see search results. This is before they can critically evaluate or critically compare the different search results to see if he's an actor from sources, right? And do a source comparison. So my argument is these things are problematic in the sense that they reinforce false narratives and also, you know, literally fake news. So not things that are, this is disinformation rather than misinformation. So, uh, and then you, but you know, you just see this over and over again. Are these types of search results actually reinforcing um, things that, you know, we need to deal with in terms of journalism and in terms of media and reporting the truth? Um, or are these simply just uh, a populist representation of previous searches? So I'll come back to my... So going on here. So like I said, what, is, you know, what does this mean for journalism when you have these types? It's, you know, it, a lot of this stuff is toxic, and you know, I, I consider it um, it's negative, it's stereotypes, um, it's, it's counter to kind of what's understood as, as facts and truth, but it's also in a way negative and it's parasitic. So how does this play into democracy? Um, 
I went into YouTube in particular because YouTube was uh, one of the platforms that had a major problem. Uh, they actually had to manually take down some of the trending fake videos uh, that, that were claiming uh, these children were actors and that um, this was staged. Like, so you get the false flag narrative, you get the stage narrative. These, you know, this, this whole thing was set up by the, by the government, by the deep state. Um, and so what I did was I, I wanted to see what people, you know, not just search results and not just the suggestions, but what people, what kind of network people were entering when they went to that first video. What was the gateway? So this is, this is the gateway kind of to conspiracy. So I wanted to look at this actually not only in the context of a crisis actor situation or fact checking, but also in the larger context of when kids search for this, these things, when children especially, or when people who don't understand, you know, when they kind of land on a, on a, on a YouTube page, what are those other things that show up on autoplay? And I, you know, 95% of people have autoplay set for YouTube, so it just it keeps spooling. Um, so I, using the YouTube API, I went and I pulled all the recommendations. So I kind of I set up a seed, and then I pulled each recommendations for the rest of the videos that would kind of queue in that auto in the autoplay lineup, essentially. So this is this is what it looks like. So the, so the videos that I'm going to talk about or that that are going to be shown on this network are actually the ones on the right there. You know, in almost all cases, they're they're identical. Um, so this is an NBC uh, YouTube video, a fact-checking video about crisis actors. It's trying, it's trying to it's trying to debunk. It's a debunking, you know, short episode on you know this isn't real. This is this is not true. Don't believe this. And then you have a lineup of just conspiracy, and you have you all sorts it? of conspiracy theorists. Oh, what? Can you read it? Can you read some of the titles? Uh, so mind-blowing conspiracy. Um, Joe Rogan on the Florida shooting. Ten conspiracy theories that turned out to be true. Uh, another top 10 conspiracy theories. And it just goes on, 10, ten strangest biblical conspiracy theories. So these are the types of things, so it, you enter once, you know, in, in an effort to try to fact check, you're actually being, you're, you're being brought in and submerged into an ecosystem of essentially a propaganda content. So again, this is mostly um, something that, you know, I, this is an analysis. I don't really have a conclusion. I mean, I do have conclusions about, about why this matters, but I don't have an answer for exactly what this means in the context of the larger system of democracy. Uh, but when you look at these maps, so these are network maps of all thousands of videos that are, and all of, I linked um, from a network perspective, all of those recommendations together. And what you end up it with is you enter these huge uh, nodes about Illuminati, about chemtrails, uh, about Frogs make, you know, it's the Alex Jones kind of conspiracy. Uh, but, ba but most of the uh, past terror events and domestic, um, domestic shootings, domestic mass shootings are all represented in here as, as false flags, as conspiracies. So again, I mean, people say, well, people need to see these things to understand and make sense of this. So they need to see this for themselves and they need to understand. And if you start removing things like this, it becomes a censorship and then it's a free speech issue. So, and also the Pizzagate is in here. I mean, so you have Hollywood sex slaves, you have Will Ferrell and The Rock for pedophilia, Pizzagate explained, the Illuminati are about to make their final move, all the Soros stuff. So, just to kind of show, you know, so these are some of the recommendations that you see when you're brought into this from fact-checking videos. And I, one of them kind of really stood out and it was called Truth or Dare with Rape. And I just, I mean, so this troubles me in the sense that YouTube, this, this suggests to me that YouTube actually is losing control of their, of their space. I mean, whether it's due to sheer content, whether it's due to you know, not optimizing their algorithms correctly or, or not being able to keep up, I think it's mostly a content problem. Just the sheer volume of content cannot be managed by a couple of algorithms and a few people. So whether what, this, what that video actually has, I, never even, I don't even want to know. I mean, I'm, I, other people can, can take the list and, and go and do a content analysis. So, but you just get over and over again a reinforcement of things that are not true, factually not true, crisis actor, crisis actor, crisis actor. So um, as you go through here, you know, it expands that crisis actor, and then you start to kind of fall in or trip into an Alice in Wonderland type situation where you fall down a rabbit hole of, well, you know, if it's possible that the Parkland crisis actors, you know, wh well, what about Sandy Hook, right? And this has been, so all these, all these other things kind of resurface in this network. Um, and over and over again, these are kind of the network maps here. You know, I even saw the Oklahoma City bombing in here. So, uh, you know, there's all sorts of, so basically every single uh, past terror event, especially the domestic ones, are portrayed as false flags, as portrayed by, and a lot of them are, are worded in a way that are kind of asking questions, but then they bring you into, you know, 
it's basically, they're, they're trying to insert a shadow of doubt rather than try to convince you, which is much easier, obviously. So I'm just kind of going through here. You can take a look at my, I, I did a short analysis of this, Bohemian Grove, you get all of it, Bilderberg, I mean, you get the whole propaganda ecosystem. Uh, Homeland Security, D they, they say that uh, DHS is actually hiring crisis actors. And, um, but more problematic is just uh, the fact that this exists and it's being recommended. I guess that's, that's, my, that's my main issue. I mean, I mean, I don't have a problem with, you know, all of these things, but the fact that it's being kind of recommended, you know, and again, you know, people point out, well, you know, it used to be when you were checking out of the grocery store, you know, there was a National Enquirer. Now, is that a recommendation? Are they, are they kind of queuing up the National Enquirer in a way? I guess so. But this is sending different kinds of signals because of the way that it's monetized. And I think this is going to become a huge debate in, you know, on censorship and free speech and, and how this works and how representation and how people are kind of uh, positioned against elites, especially media elites. So my idea is, you know, most, most of these platforms, especially things like YouTube and Facebook, they're built with, an idea, with, with this idealistic notion of connecting the world. But, and they've built an infrastructure around promoting this, around connecting everyone. But the, the problem is, is that once it reaches a certain critical mass, uh, and I would almost argue that that critical mass is when they go public. I mean, that they're responsible, that responsibility sw switches over to shareholders. It switches over to revenues and profit, rightly, because they have to operate a business. So I think the duty that, you know, that these plat or th these, these companies like Facebook have really set up have, has really shifted from kind of this idealistic notion of connecting the world to basically bottom line. I mean, and that's, that's just the unfortunate reality. I mean, I, I don't want to sound like business is not a good thing or that money, making money is always unethical, right? But I think that the argument more is that, is that, it's, that, that the duty has really shifted over to something that is based on economics. So where I position these types of things, where these, where these conspiracies, you know, over and over again, the Twitter, the autocompletes, I don't know if these are, if this is as populism as much as uh, the ways that these platforms work by not admitting their media companies, right? That we're, we're, we're a technology company, we're, we don't have the responsibility, to Section 230, that we actually have to regulate or monitor or, you know, we, we, just, we just deliver. We, we just provide the infrastructure for the content to get to you. So just the, it's the middleman theory. It's the meta business theory. So they don't, you know, when you make these arguments, you're basically excluding yourself from democratic processes. So you're, 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 you're stepping outside of, of, of social sphere and responsibility. And uh, I love this quote. Uh, this is from YouTube CEO. And so Kara Swisher was interviewing her uh, at the beginning of this month. And I, I just, her answers were just striking to me uh, in, in how they think about these things as, you know, as a, as a, as a company. So she asked, she was, Kara Swisher was ask, asking her about Logan Paul, which is a famous YouTube creator uh, who made, he was, he was making some pretty nasty videos. One of them had a, uh, a suicide and he was like filming and someone was hanging in a tree behind it. So it caused this uproar uh, that he was actually in this Japanese forest where people are known to hang themselves and filming. But, you know, he was filming himself right behind someone who was hanging in a tree. Um, so huge outrage. But so Kara Swisher was asking uh, Susan about this, and she says, well, our platform has three components. It basically, so we have users, we have creators, and we have advertisers. And I was like, are you, this really? Um, I mean, this is like fundamental. This is like, what she, this is how they consider the structure of their platform and how it's built up from, from kind of, you know, how it's envisioned. So going back to that utilitarian idea, you know, it's, if it hurts everyone, but it's, I think it's more if it, if it hurts them or hurts their business. So I, it's really a case of when you are looking at these types of things, it's, it's, it's more of a protection of values than it is a protection, or it's, more, it's less of a protection of values than it is a protection of revenue. Of course they're gonna have values. Of course they're gonna have community rules and terms of service. But from what I've seen, it's, it's become really problematic in the sense that there's a very selective enforcement. Uh, you know, only when the Daily Beast or only when the New York Times reports on something that's just egregious, that they will take these types of content down. So and this, this, does, this is a slippery slope that spills all the way over into the info wars, the conspiracies, the crisis actors. So it's only when there's, there's enough outrage that it becomes a liability in terms of revenue will they actually take some of, these content, some of this content down. So that's, that's not censorship. That's actually selective. It's, you know, it's selective moderation and uh, preferential you know, responsibility. It's, it's, they're, they're shunning a lot of the... Um, components that are involved in a healthy democracy, right? So, and I, I, just, I really don't think that they ever consider, 
uh, users of platforms like YouTube citizens. And this is kind of, this, so the, I'm making big arguments here, but why not? So I, I love this quote as well, and this was in the Columbia, Journal, uh, Columbia Political Review uh, early this year. And so it's kind of making the sense, or making an argument that um, you know, free, free speech is great. It doesn't, there's, it doesn't protect right or wrong, uh, but its rise has really been enabled by the ability for platforms to amplify voices. So the problem, sorry, the problem with that is that the, is, is the false amplification through bots, through machines, and through kind of automation is rising, is basically creating you know, almost like a pseudo-populism. So it's, it's making, it's, it's increasing voices, it's increasing the um, ability for minority voices that are positioned directly against elites to actually um, be heard. So, what, so it's in a way, like we need to understand if this, is, if this is real or if it's fake, or if it's partly fake. Um, so I'll just try to finish up here again, over and over again, and this is, the, this is a very common situation, uh, and Sheryl Sandberg on Facebook is, has a similar type of outlook, um, are you a media company, Swisher asked, and she said, we are a technology platform, okay, but the output of our product is media. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just dumbfounded, right? I, I can't, these, these, these types of quotes just, like, they get me, they, get, they raise my blood pressure. I read this and I'm like, are you, like, I mean, that, that's, like, that's the only way, you could phrase that, I mean, it's basically, we, yeah, we are a media company, but, but we aren't, so. The output of our product is media, okay. Um, so my, you know, just going through this, I really think that, again, is this, is, is what we're seeing is the, is the, are the things that are showing up in autocomplete, are the recommendations on YouTube, is this a result of what we didn't see before? And what has, you know, what is just coming into the light or being shined into the light? Or is this something that is, um, it's organic versus false or falsely amplified? And is this, these are questions, these aren't, these aren't, I'm not making statements here, but you know, is this a liability to journalism and truth and fact checking and and media, especially the, the business of the business of journalism and the and the kind of goal of journalism to provide the public with reliable information? And the answer, I mean, there's kind of a trick question because you know, because of the ways algorithms work and because of the they're, because the business model underlying YouTube are based on proprietary opaque technologies, which they will never reveal, which is because it's like the formula for Coca-Cola, we'll never, we'll never really know. And this is gonna become, over and over again, this is gonna become a worse problem. I think it's going to kind of blow up. And then also, we, ha we always have to consider, we, t we tend to focus on the, on the United States when we talk about fake news and misinformation. It's, it's, it's you know, unfortunate. But you know, I, I did go in and look at you know, what, were, what was coming up for other countries. So you know, the Rohingya are um, man-eaters, like they're not immigrant, they're illegal immigrants, they're not innocent. So, so what does this mean for country, or for, I guess, markets that are not democ democratic, or so, but still, it's still problematic because it reinforces um, things that potentially have very serious and very real cultural consequences. People getting stabbed on trains, for example. People, you know, acting out in ways that they normally would not act. So, you know, what it really comes down to, these are big questions, big issues, but, you know, automated systems, I've kind of, I've, I've revisited that through the presentation. Um, trends, trying to influence trends to get in front of journalists' face. So this is why I call Twitter, Twitter is kind of a decoy in a lot of ways because it doesn't reach many people, but it does re reach influencers, journalists, community leaders, politicians. So the use of Twitter really is to manipulate not the public, but elites. And of course, you know, we're good, I don't want to get into the AI rabbit hole, but, but you know, things are starting to be created automatically. Um, and I, I will stop, and these are just a couple of examples of, um, you know, this is the Twitter search, very similar to Google, Crisis Actor. And, uh, and then you have these more closed, I would say, partisan social networks like Gab, uh, which is invite only, that's, you know, are just perpetuating, you know, Facebook doesn't want you to know, these, these platforms don't want you to know. It's censorship, they're trying to, they're trying to hide the real truth. And I, I wanna emphasize that not all conspiracies end up being wrong, right? I mean, it, it, the government does lie to you. The, the government has lied to us. The, things come out that are conspiracies or begin with conspiracies that actually become true. And I think one of the, the best examples of that is the Snowden revelations, you know? I mean, so, so it, it, in many cases, you know, we, we aren't told the truth. Uh, so. The, I guess the question is, is where do you draw the line and, and how? But without knowing how the technology is delivering uh, content and videos, we'll never know. And that's, 
all I have to say. Thanks. I, I think we're in big trouble. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to say I thought the last presentation was really fascinating and raises a whole lot of very interesting questions. And uh, I was very impressed with that. Um, what I wanted to talk about today was that I think we have reached a, a new stage. And we have, this sounds cliched, but we have a tension now between freedom of the press and freedom from the press. The Trump administration has, as a careful program, demonized the press constantly and consistently, and they have been very successful at this. If you look at the poll data, a plurality of voters view the press as producing fake news, and a smaller percentage view the press and the media generally as credible. It is, uh, it is a contest that is the other side is winning. The very fact of this conflict, and it's different in the Trump administration than it has been in prior administrations. In the past, there's always been a tension with politicians saying stories are wrong or they're tilted or the press is biased, whatever. Trump is really trying to say that the press is an, he does say the press is an enemy, that the press is creating fake news, that the press is against the interests of the United States, that it is a force basically for evil. This is a different tone and tenor from what we have seen in the past. Uh, what it does is very difficult for the media to deal with. And I say the media generally, I sort of mean the press, but I, uh, the press has gone from a position of being an outside observer. It's where it could, even with fights over the stories, where the stories are accurate or not, could report on that, to where the media itself is the subject of the conflict. He is attacking an institution in the media uh, not just the press as a reporting entity. Uh, the media cannot, main in this situation, is put into a strange box. It wants to maintain its role as objector, objective or semi-objective, well, let's say fair-minded as opposed to object, uh, objective, reporter of events recording what's being done, trying to find out what's going on. But it has been placed in the center of the debate, and it is the subject of the debate. It, now, that's, that's one thing. It, it, uh, the question that the media faces now as one, one, it has to adjust to it an entirely different landscape in terms of the con conflicts and coverage because it is dealing with an entity, the Trump administration, that is trying to destroy its legitimacy. That is a different ball game from what the press has faced before. Uh, and it doesn't know I say it, we, I don't, what, however you want to put this, what, how deep the assault, the motivations behind the assault are. One of the institutional functions of the press and the media is to put a check on the exercise of executive power. Is the media in this, is the assault on the media simply Trump bitching about his coverage, which it is to some extent, or is this an attempt to allow him more authoritarian leeway without the check of the media? Now again, this puts the press in a very difficult situation because nothing is more alienated than claiming you're the protector of, uh, of, of rights. People don't like elitist claims like that. And it puts the 
press basically like a turtle on its back in that situation. Um, I, I would argue there's been some recent books on this and that Trump has pressed what you would call, what he I would what others have called democratic illiberalism or democracy without rights. One of the protectors of rights is the media. Minority rights, and I, I don't mean just of minorities, but of those not in the majority, it, that is a crucial role of the media and it's a crucial role of democracy. Is Trump attempting to really assault that larger structure that underpins democracy. The me I and the media don't know how fully thought it out, how fully thought out this is, but the press is caught in this conflict without really knowing what is the scope and depth of the opposition. How fully thought out it's hard to think of Trump fully thinking out anything, but, but in fact, or how intuitively th thought out is this? He, ha he has clearly done a pretty good job on his side. If, and if you look at all the polling data, which I have a collection of here, the, the press is not in good shape. And I think it's in a particularly bad shape uh, given the nature of this conflict. Uh, it was striking that, that, that his authoritarian instincts, even some on the right, Americans for limited government after Trump said, uh, we ought to just arrest these guys and then take their guns later. Conservative groups are up in arms about that statement, although Trump may be backing off about that. Americans for limited government, a very conservative group, said President Trump's statement that he wants to take away guns first and have due process later flies in the face of basic constitutional principles under the Fifth uh, Amendment. The president knows better than anyone that a person is innocent until proven guilty. I don't think he, that's true. <laughs> but, uh, and to deny those rights is unacceptable. Uh, but he clearly, in fact, he doesn't think in terms of, of rights, and he doesn't think in terms of the, 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 the complexities of an issue when the government begins to exercise its executive power. He has talked praisingly of these guys, the, the, uh, the head of uh, the Philippines, who shoots uh, drug dealers, uh, and he has said that again. Th there is, and I, for much of my thinking, I'm dependent on this. There was a very good article produced uh, by two, well, by a guy named Ronell Anderson Jones of the University of Utah Law School and Lisa Gross' son of the Brigham Young University Law School. Interesting that Utah is producing mm -hmm. a very good defense. Uh, well, we'll see, I'll, I'll describe what they say. They, they describe what Trump is doing as a process known as enemy construction. This is to turn your adversaries into enemies by portraying them as extreme. It, uh, it is a authoritarian tactic. Uh, it is used to, to make, to mobilize your supporters, but to make your supporters believe the most evil about who your adversaries are. Uh, that the way they write that is, uh, which officials use war rhetoric, it's often war, and other signaling behaviors to convey that a person or institution is not merely an institution that, although wholly legitimate, has engaged in behavior, behaviors that are disappointing or disapproved but instead an illegitimate enemy triggering, there's a reference to a guy named Carl Schmidt, Schmitt, Schmittian excep exceptionalism and justifying the compromise of ordinarily recognized liberties. The Bill of Rights is a collection of protection of liberties in many respects. 
I, uh, undercutting the watchdog, educator, and proxy functions of the press through any enemy construction leaves the administration more capable of delegitimizing other institutions and constructing other enemies, including the judiciary, the intelligence community, immigrants, and members of certain races and religions, because the viability and traction of counter narratives becomes uh, greatly diminished. And I think all of those fit at least in part to this administration. Now, the press, as I said, is vulnerable to this for a number of reasons. One, I think the press has been elitist and it has, in a way, played into the hands of the right in many respects, especially in the cover coverage of social and cultural issues, but also the coverage of economic issues. Uh, secondly, the press is uh, vulnerable because the press uh, is financially strapped. When you have a lot of money, as the press did back in the 70s and 80s, you can flex your muscles, you can tell some complaining politician, go to hell, uh, take a walk. When you're down and out, your fight is down and out. And it is a bad situation for, for much of the media to be in this condition. And that's true both of uh, the press and a lot of TV. Uh, the polarization of social issues is another factor that is, has hurt the media in the sense that on social issues, the press is almost universally liberal. The press is pro-choice, pro-affirmative action, pro you name it, pro uh, transgender rights, uh, all of these things. And that you can read in their coverage. And so it, they lose credibility among those who do not share those values. Thirdly, they've been subject to, as Rick has described, and a sustained assault by uh, conservative groups. Uh, and the, now the uh, digital media has given the president especially direct access to voters that he doesn't need to depend on the press as an intermediary. Clearly Twitter is the choice of uh, Trump's favorite weapon. I, this go, let me continue more with what those two authors wrote. Enemy construction that diminishes the watchdog, educator, and proxy role of the press opens the door. No, I already read that. Uh, pr Trump's enemy construction of the press should not be discounted as mere puffery, but be she recognized uh, for the dire risks that it pose, poses. And I think that that is clearly the case. Um, and uh, we do now face a situation that is more significant and more threatening and the press is not, the main thing I would emphasize is that we, the press, are not prepared for this fight. One, we didn't pick this fight, we don't understand fighting for your own merits, and we don't, uh, and we have weakened ourselves in the way we've taken stands. Let me leave it there. Mm. Um, I wish I knew. Uh, I think that listening to the through line that we had from um, uh, Rick through uh, the, two, the two Jonathans and to um, Tom there, you know, one of the things that comes up over and over again in wondering what to do or, or indeed if we need to do anything about the current information environment is this, which is there is a long history of things like this happening and particularly when you have new types of technology available. So, you know, kind of being British, I like to uh, think about the BBC, uh, which came out of the invention of um, 
radio broadcast. Uh, it was in the wake of the Second World War. Oh, sorry, the First World War. It was uh, set up in 1922. There was a, a sort of a visceral fear on the part of um, the British government that the kinds of um, communications that they'd seen sort of via distributed pamphlets in the First World War and the, and the kind of political disruption would be much, much worse if uh, radio broadcasting fell into the hands of anyone who was not the government. So it was sort of set up as an engineering, um, engineering project. Uh, and we always have these moments of, of, of feeling um, unsure about the source of our information um, and who controls it and whether this is a good thing. And then we kind of, you know, hash it out and we carry on and in, in general this has sort of worked. So that's one sort of school of thought that says we don't need to do very much about this. We need to just let the platforms kind of, you know, sort it out themselves. That's absolutely what you'll hear from Google. It's what you'll hear from Facebook. Jack Dorsey put up a set of tweets yesterday saying we no longer just want to be about, um, you know, whatever it was we were about before. We actually want to be about, I wrote his words down somewhere in case my phone went flat, which it did. He said we're committing Twitter uh, uh, we're, uh, to help increase the public health, openness and civility of public conversation um, and hold ourselves publicly accountable uh, towards that progress which is a big change from, um, so, so in other words, sort of, sort of Johnson's, I think, really good provocation, which is a lot of what we see at the moment is really the strapping of a, a kind of slightly sort of simplistic model of free speech across a, um, a venture capital funded Silicon Valley ideal of how to kind of optimize everything for targeting and and profit so it's sort of it's it's, it's if you like this sort of this 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 free market model gone 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 mad um the uh, the other version of this says this is different this is like really different this is not like everything else we've had before because it isn't confined by territory um you know there are no national borders really on the internet and no national borders within these large kind of new types of gatekeeper um, the speed and scale of, of, of what, what they can deliver and, and, and the individuality of that targeting. So in other words, we kind of, we've had a long period of time where most dissemination of news, whether it's the paper that you see on the newsstand or the evening news broadcast, has been, has been a sort of broadly a broadcast model. Um, and we're now moving into a world where we will all receive slightly different messages at slightly different times. So back to sort of John's point about, you know, kind of blue feed, red feed, and, uh, and, and, and Jonathan's excellent research showing just how very different um, an environment you can occupy if you decide to go down a route that says that you want to reject, you know, the, 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 the common narrative, or even, you know, the kind of the facts that are being established by, by, by journalists. Um, and I think that there's, I think there's a speed and a scale issue, but I think there's also this convergence issue of, you know, somebody described um, uh, Jennifer uh, Gringell, who's a an academic at Syracuse. We had a session on moderation last week. She described uh, sort of Trump's Twitter feed, which is a great phrase, as state-run social media. You know, we have these kind of miniature kind of outlets now, which are just running through these platforms, which won't differentiate between different types of messages. So, you know, the, the whole success of um, Facebook, which is really significant, you know, it's a $500 million capitalized company that didn't exist in 2004, effectively. You know, the, the, these are kind of, these are huge engines of wealth. Um, but their whole design is really about not differentiating between any type of message at all. But between it, it, that they want the, the, the quickest and cheapest circulation of material uh, because that is the best way to aggregate data from which you build a highly effective targeting sort of mechanism. Um, and really that means that we have a media landscape at the moment which has no regulation at all effectively operating in it. You know, we don't, we, for the first time we're in this big sort of live experiment about what is it like to live in a truly unregulated media environment if you get all of your information online. You know, we don't have licenses in the same way that broadcasters do. You know, we don't have kind of um, any restriction in terms of what it costs to put material out there. And we don't have publishers who decide, yes, this is the type of material 
uh, we want on our platforms. No, this isn't. You know, those are new kind of those are new sort of imperatives for for for, for, for the platforms. So I kind of err uh, to the this is different camp. Um, what can we do to get out of these filter bubbles? There is an enormous set of sort of conversations internally and externally um, and pan-nationally you know Europe as being a, a is being more of a driver I think for regulation of um, platform power than America either is or is likely to be just because Europe is a much more sort of it's, its history is one of, of, of greater regulation around media um, but we don't really have in, in truth and even in Europe we don't really have the instruments or even the language to know how to <laughs> regulate these new types of organizations. So, you know, one of the things we have to start thinking about is if we, you know, we do, we're fairly sure the market is not going to sort this out. You know, this is not something that we, we, we're fairly sure that, um, s that the current way that we think about monopoly regulation and antitrust law is not going to be particularly useful in this setting um, and we have this kind of model of you know free speech and to Tom's point about uh, you know kind of that, that the sort of freedom of the press there's there's also the right um, you know the right of audiences to hear to hear things which are important or useful or timely to them and the ecosystem that Jonathan sort of sketched out um, crowds out that right of the citizen to hear uh, and in America, it's um, a problem that we're just becoming aware of. But in lots of other parts of the world, it's, it's already sort of at the point where, you know, kind of if you look at the proliferation of um, bot armies or not even bot armies, but these kind of these, 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 these operations like the IRA that have a mixture of amplified speech, um, human interaction, kind of uh, false identities, etc. Um, if you have, if you if you think about McLuhan's point to the you know the next world war, he said was would not be fought you know by armies and on the grounds it would be fought by in cyberspace and there would be no differentiation between civilians and 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 the military, uh, and we're kind of at that point you know in a way if you look at what happened um, over the course of the past two years, um, and if you look at places like Myanmar at the moment and how Facebook is used uh, by the um, authorities there and how the spreading of um, propaganda or, or government messages can drown out um, or, 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 or weaken the press. We're sort of at that moment now where we have, where we, where we, where we, where McLuhan sort of put us when he was talking about this in, in the early 70s. Um, you can become very alarmist and sort of fatalistic. I mean, I, I think on the upside, we know what the problems are now, that we have opacity in these systems that if they're unregulated, they tend to bend towards authoritarianism and populism very easily. I mean, that's something else we don't discuss, which is that actually open systems are great, but open systems need to be properly policed and audited on a pretty regular basis. Um, that the, the existing platforms are going to have to do a, move a lot further, both in reforming their business models um, and in allowing us access to data so that we can see what's going on, um, if they're going to achieve this, you know, sort of ideal of actually being good actors in terms of reconstructing the public sphere, um, and they're going to have to do it in a way which is sort of culturally uh, sensitive to each different geography as well, I think. Sorry, that's a long answer, but that's fine. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Um, you came around um, sort of directly to the issues of, of um, populism and um, problem of needing to regulate uh, so that we don't move towards authoritarianism. Um, one of the things that uh, sort of came up a couple of times in what people were talking about were um, the issue of polls. And I think we tend to think in, in terms of a democracy of, you know, one voice, one vote, you know, they're, they're kind of associated. And one of the places these voices happen is in polls as well as uh, in the actual voting booth. And with this technological threat 
that we're seeing in, in um, you know, these very in Google searches and such. And uh, I asked yesterday about the role of bots, which has kind of come up today too. Um, is there any implication? Uh, polls clearly have a, a major force in the political process. They affect a lot of political decisions. So I'm just wondering if there's any threat or where, where the issue of all of this manipulation and technological change um, what role these play in the process of polling itself and uh, its relationship to media? I mean, I think that's a good question. I don't have a point on polling. Um, yeah, why don't we try to see what it's a super thing. See if we can just we'll sort of go through the questions and then maybe yeah. they'll. So this is a very useful immensity you've laid out for us, all of you. Uh, I have a question that's very specific for Jonathan Albright, and it, I think you'll see why I'm asking it. I mean, you, you were talking about, the, you're, you're trying to illustrate the patterns of the, for the diffusion of disinformation, right? Uh, I mean, that's what your diagram illustrates. So we, what's one thing you and others have been trying to do since the campaign is trying to figure out how disinformation clusters, what channels it runs down, and so on. And I'm wondering if you have any research on other on channels of other kinds of disinformation which are not overtly political. And I'm thinking now about the current meme, as I was just told it's known, of the flat earth. Um, is there, I, I mean, so what's behind my question is wondering whether there is a kind of parasociety that has developed or a paraculture th through which bullshit moves and is impervious to what we thought of in the metaphor of the free marketplace as fluidity, juxtaposition of views, John Stuart Millian discourse, et cetera. Um, a lot, so much stuff on the table. <laughs> a lot of people on the table, too. Uh, um, too bad we can't go on further, but um, simple question um, about conspiracy. I'm a little troubled by the idea that this is, the implication at least, that this is, you know, kind of new. Uh, we're, didn't have the implication because he knows it's not, but I think, uh, or it's particularly more dangerous now, more widespread now. Um, you know, remember that we had, there are two political parties in the antebellum U.S. The anti-Masons and the Know Nothings both ran presidential candidates. Both had a, you know, they were full of fake news and conspiracy theories. Uh, the Nazi Party would have been impossible without the idea that um, Jews and socialists uh, were responsible for Germany's defeat. Um, so. Conspiracy theories have been with us, you know, forever. So I'm just curious what, you know, besides social media, um, bots and all the technology that we know about, and you've all spoken about it in, in wonderful detail, what's really new about this? Uh, isn't, in some ways, conspiracy theories part of the history of governance and, and anti-governance? Questions for Tom Edsel. Uh, I was wondering, has the press been fair in its demonization of Mr. Trump, or doesn't fairness count in the 21st century? Or does it, what is the second half? Does fairness doesn't count? fairness count in the 21st century? Uh, the, the, th the thought I had uh, on the presentations and the questions is I'm getting very frustrated, frustrated and I was in a previous conference I went to in, of political, comparative political people by the word polarization because the symmetry that it implies between uh, left-wing dispositions, right-wing dispositions, conservatism, liberalism, to me just, it's, not a, it's not a useful map of the world right now. Um, this is an ideal type and honored in the breach. There are plenty of liberal biases in the world, and there's also uh, plenty of inquisitive conservatives. But uh, we have a word for uh, people who existentially live in the world in a way that, and we, uh, where they try to struggle against the condition of being in a filter bubble. That word is liberal. 
we have a word for people who um, uh, use information uh, as a tool to confirm biases and broadcast biases. That word is conservative. Uh, it's a bad thing that people are separated, them, separating themselves socially. It's a bad thing that people get different streams of information. But to me, unless we, to use an uh, old SDS term, name the system, uh, the problem I think we're talking about, and, and uh, for, for analytically clarity, for analytic clarity purposes, is authoritarian right-wing populism. Uh, and uh, I think that really comes out. Uh, yes, there were some completed Google searches that uh, could be, uh, suggest left-wing conspiracy theories, but most of them uh, are not, uh, are not. That's my thought. Tom Edsel's point about the crisis of the media, if you look at the confidence level in the media that was in the mid-70s, uh, that is to say around 70, 74 percent uh, during the 1970s, that is now down in the 30s. So the sense of people's willingness to distrust what they actually read in the New York Times or they hear on CBS News or CNN um, makes them that much more vulnerable to conspiracy theory. So I'd say that's something that has changed, and something that we didn't talk about today because there just wasn't time, was um, the, the the impact of the deregulation of media that took place under Reagan, 1987, getting rid of the equal time doctrine, the fairness time fairness doctrine, which led to Rush Limbaugh, Fox News. That I think is something that also changed the game and prepared uh, the terrain for some of the stuff that. Um, uh, we saw in the social media end. I mean, I mean, I did say things are different. I don't necessarily think they're worse. I think that, you know, we've better, if you are a woman or a person of colour, then pretty much everything was fake news up until really very recently. You know, you didn't see yourself represented as you were um, in the mainstream media at all. You know, so we're not... Um, but, it, uh, but I think that thing about is it worse can sometimes cloud the is it different and the, I, I think there is something that we haven't quite got to but ab about the sort of op opacity of systems and also the convergence of all types of activity so Facebook for instance is saving journalism by working with journalistic organizations to kind of construct new ways to tell stories and at the same time they're working with politicians to get them elected or re-elected etc you know we haven't seen I think some of those systems working in that way on exactly the same sort of opaque platforms before I could be wrong but I think that to me that's the more interesting question which is Um, Michael Flynn, um, thanks to the Washington Post in particular, is no longer in the administration. Uh, Anthony Scaramucci, no, no longer in the administration, uh, thanks to the New Yorker. Uh, Tom Price is no longer in the administration, thanks to Politico. And nobody questioned, well, they did immediately, those results, but those results held. Um, so, yes, that there's a lot of distrust of the media that uh, Mr. Trump is promoting, but it, it seems to me that we, that we need to know more to, or be more precise about what trust and distrust of the media mean.